What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Dynasty Talk with Sam. Uh, today, we're going to be covering some week one overreactions. Uh, basically, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be saying some outrageous statements to Nick here, and Nick is going to give me his take on if he thinks it's true, false, or if it's maybe in the middle. But uh, happy to have you on, Nick. How are you doing, man? Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, what is uh, first reaction week one? How do you feel about everything we saw this week? Man, I mean, I you're always in for chaos week one of an NFL season, but um, you know, especially when your fantasy lineup gets directly hurt, it, it leaves you with a different feeling on on Monday and Tuesday. Um, you know, so it, I think we're in for a lot of overreactions, and uh, I'm happy to talk about them and kind of give you my thoughts on on where the landscape falls moving forward here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we wait all summer and we anticipate the start of the year so much that when we finally get something, it's super easy to fall into a trap of just instantly switching everything we thought and going with the first thing that comes across our minds. So I think we're going to have a fun show today. So to get it kicked off, my first week one overreaction, Tyreek Hill should have been the 1-1 in fantasy drafts this summer, assuming non-super flex. I'm not saying we should have been taking him over Patrick Mahomes or something. Sure, sure. I mean, you can definitely make the argument, right? Um, I think on a week-to-week basis, there's not a single wide receiver running back that can put up more points. You know, I think you can make the argument that um, he's in the top offense in the league right now. Um, Those things together, I mean, when we walk away from that week with the amount of yards that Tua had, Right. And, you know, kind of look at look at it over the course of a season. We could be in line for a monster season from a second year head coach in, in McDaniels. Right. And, you know, really see this this whole thing really pop off in Miami. And he's going to be the biggest beneficiary of that. Tyreek Hill has put up numbers like this in the past. We can't be surprised. And he, you could really make that argument. Now, for me personally, I still had Jefferson one. I had uh Jamar Chase too going into this year. And I'm not disappointed with that. I have a lot of shares of Justin Jefferson, but I'm definitely left wishing I had a little bit more Tyreek Hill. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like you said, Jefferson put up over 100 yards in the first half of the game. Um, So not that anyone is worried about Justin Jefferson. Chase, however, had a rough game. I think we all think he's probably going to bounce back. But um, it's hard not to come away from that Miami offense thinking – you know, maybe we should have been drafting Tua a little higher than people thought this offseason. And along with that, Tyreek, um, I don't think I would go as far as putting him at the 1-1. You know, that is my overreaction of the situation. But he looked unstoppable, man. He, He looked completely unguardable. They were running him on, like, motions, but to the outside. And then he was, like, almost getting, like, a head start and running his route off of these motions and you just felt bad for the cornerback watching that. I was like, I don't even know what you're supposed to do to stop that. Yeah. And we're going to talk about some players that I think a little bit later on that don't know how to be utilized within their offense. Miami understands who they have with their personnel and they want to use him in, in any way they can. You get that guy in space and there's not a single player on the field that can keep up with them. You know, so any chance that, like if I'm an offensive coordinator, my offense should be running through him. Um, and I'm glad to see that Miami's taking that approach and they're proving it week one. So the fantasy outlook for Tyreek moving forward, you have to be happy with. But you, you did bring up Tua, right? It all hinges on Tua. I mean, we're putting a lot of stock in Tua. Um, totally agree. You know, I, I had him over Deshaun this year. That was like kind of where I had him, but in that range, not ahead of Trevor Lawrence. Um, and I'm not surprised by this type of performance. But anything, a big, we're a big hit away. And, and you never want to really talk about that. And, you know, you can't predict injuries. And we don't want to be sitting here playing doctor. Um, but there's going to be a lot of pressure on Miami to potentially have him out longer than you typically would if he were to suffer another head injury. And that scares me. Um, you know, combined with Tyreek's age, you know, I'm usually of the opinion I go with the younger talent, right? I don't want to be left holding the bag, so to speak. But I think. Hills proved right away that um, we're, we're, we're engines go here for, uh, for this season. 
So overreaction number two for the week, the NFL has figured out the Eagles offense from last season. Yeah, I don't think the Eagles know who they are this season. I'll be honest with you. Um, we don't really – we saw Gamewell get I, – I believe it was over 65. You can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but around 65% of the total um, shares out of the backfield in this offense. We didn't really think that heading into this year. We thought it was going to be the DeAndre Swift show. Um, the offensive line had a rough day. You know, they had a lot of pressure on Jalen Hurts. Combined with the fact that we have a new offensive coordinator and Brian Johnson, I'm not surprised that they're sluggish out of the gate. I think it says more about them needing to ramp up to speed than it says about the Patriots having the secret sauce of how to defeat the Eagles. You know, Jalen Hurts didn't really take any shots downfield. Dallas Goddard had zero receptions. This is going to be a game plan type offense. And we need to kind of be prepared for that. At any given moment, it could be a variety of different guys within this offense that are producing and other guys that are going to be quiet. So from a fantasy lens, we have to keep that into consideration when kind of looking at these guys and who you might want to target for, for trades. Um, but I don't think that they know really which direction they're going on the running back spot. Um, and I think that's going to be an area to watch moving forward. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear their names come up in trade conversations for running backs. Yeah, and I think something, too, that my first, like, you know, if you want to say, calm yourself down, the Eagles are going to be fine, is that Bill Belichick had all offseason to game plan for this game. So the fact that the Patriots defended them well week one, knowing what they were going to get, can't be a huge surprise that New England would play good defense against someone. Right. New England plays good defense against a bunch of teams. That's not something new to the NFL. Um, and like you said, I'm not going to overreact too much. I think all the weapons in Philly are going to be fine. The Goddard one was obviously frustrating to live through week one. If you started him, I'm still throwing him out there next week with no concerns. Um, the one point for me that I'm not going to say I'm concerned, but I think it's something that they're going to have to figure out a little more is that even though I don't think Miles Sanders last year was this incredible player, I do think he fit what they wanted from a running perspective at the running back position a little more than what they're finding right now. And without the threat of running, I mean, last year they would just run, 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 and then hit you deep. And in that Patriots game, they weren't really getting those chunk run plays. And like I said, that could just be the New England defense. Um, but I think that is something that they are going to have to figure out who's the guy to get those yards for them. And if, if it really is game well, or if you like, like you said, if they're going to have to figure out to get someone in there, that's going to be able to rip off five, six yards on first down to really set up the rest of their offense. Yeah. I mean, if I'm a, an owner of a running back within this offense right now, the only guy I feel comfortable starting is going to be game. Well, you figure Penny was a healthy scratch this week. Um, that should tell you a lot about what they feel about Penny because there was a lot of rumors in Philadelphia that they might even cut Penny, you know, heading into this year. Um, those rumors surprised me, um, but he made the roster. Here we are. But look for them to be, like I said, in consideration. I think they're trying to figure out what they have in game well. But if they're championship contenders and we know that they are, they're going to need a, a spark at that position. I feel like that is definitely something from last year they had area to improve in, and I don't think that they did that. Uh, I think that they might have taken steps back. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. But in, until I see something from DeAndre Swift, I can't have him in my lineups. Yeah, I'm definitely not rolling Swift out until I see him do it one week. And um, we got to hope that it was just a one-week thing. But even Gainwell is going to be tough to fully trust more than a flex, I think, moving forward, to be honest. So I agree. Uh, moving on to overreaction number three from week one. Drake London and Kyle Pitts are droppable. Not yet. Um, no, but I'm definitely concerned. I'm definitely concerned. I didn't think it was possible to come into this year and then not take steps forwards passing the ball. You're talking about really high draft capital on two excellent talents. Kyle Pitts was a third, uh, third overall pick, right? Uh, what was it for? Third or fourth overall pick. And then we have Drake London, who – him and of himself is a top 15 wide receiver um, uh, as far as draft capital goes. 
And to see the talent wasted is so disappointing. Um, I just don't understand how somebody can't look at those two weapons and make sure they get the ball. You can talk about game script all you want, but you don't have that type of talent and not try to get them into a rhythm early on. Um, you can see the emphasis on the run game. That's going to be their go-to attack. But you really hate to see um, the lack of attention that either of them got. Um, it's really disheartening. The only other thing that I'll add here um, is that it can't get much worse. So <laughs> I think we have better days ahead as owners of these, these two, but you're not going to get anything if you try to move them or, or for at least what they're worth. So we, this is another way to see, um, you know, don't hesitate. If you feel like you have another option to sub another guy in, uh, but for what you probably paid, they're probably in your lineups for a little bit. And so you can figure out another option. Yeah. I think for me, this, you know, obviously we're not, we're not dropping them or, you know, that is my overreaction, but this is the one I'm definitely the most concerned about yeah. or the most this is the closest statement of the three we've covered so far. I just think I'm concerned about Desmond Ritter. Just, I just think with that game plan, he's being protected. And that's not the word you want to use with the quarterback if you're trying to play those fantasy assets on a week-to-week -week basis, that they're protecting the quarterback. Like, yeah, I agree. He, Arthur Smith obviously wanted to get the run game going, and we knew that going into the season – but it doesn't mean that that has to be the only thing you can lean on. I mean, Matt Collins had more catches than Drake London. It's just the lack of creativity to get the ball into their hands that is concerning for me. I, I, I'll i take it one step further in that I think that if it's possible for somebody to be relevant, it's only going to be one of them. Like, I, I don't see – we're not going to jump to 40 pass attempts a game. I just don't think it's within the range of outcomes at this point. And I think uh, if you own one of these guys um, or you're in a situation where you're looking at possibly moving them, um, you have, if you're looking right now, you're going to have to sell them at a loss and it might not be the worst long-term answer. Um, you know, my money, if anybody's going to rebound, it would be on Drake London only because of the target share he commanded as a rookie. Um, you know, I, I think that that's, that's why I was buying him in like the fifth, sixth round range this year. Um, but unfortunately, I think I'm left, I'm left holding him right now until he proves uh proves something to me. I will roll him out in my lineup. I'm giving one, I'm giving him one more shot this week, see what he does before I'm willing to pull him out. Yeah, I mean, I think like you said, if if you are trying to move them, like it's just gonna be hard. I, I don't really see moving them as an option at this moment. Like you're gonna have to wait for them to have a game, like. I mean, at this point, like, you're not getting Zay Flowers for Drake London. No way. Like, that dude, like, that might be a target you could go after that's realistic. But I feel like you might have to pry away someone just after a one-week sample. So it's going to be hard. You might be, able to, you might be able to get away with it in your home league. You know, if you're, if, if you're around anybody who's sharp, you know, people are, are buying. I had um, somebody sent me a trade. It was uh, – Zay Flowers, and they were offering me Cortland Sutton. And I'm like, not even in the same stratosphere, my friend. Um, so uh, super high on Zay Flowers. Uh, yeah, the Atlanta's offense rest of the season, if you're a wide receiver or a tight end, not looking great. Yeah. So overreaction number four from week one, the Giants won't score a point all season long. This one I'm buying. Um, <laughs> I. I am an Eagles fan and I love to see it happen to the Giants. I got to admit, hate the fact that it came with the uh, the Cowboys laying the hammer down on them. That it's, a bit, it's bittersweet. Um, you know, I thought they might have a problem coming into the season because they don't they don't have an alpha wide receiver on their team. I mean, any team with any type of offensive success in today's day and age has at least one guy that they can they can go to um, at the wide receiver position. And I think they thought they had that with Darren Waller, um, you know, but Darren Waller is one piece. You have Saquon, that's another piece, but that's not enough. That just doesn't cut it. Um, I've never been a Daniel Jones fan. Um, I think he looked really scared back there. Um, you know, I, I think Dallas's defense is legit. You know, we have to acknowledge that they're super legit. That didn't just come as a fluke. That wouldn't have happened against just any defense. I think I think the uh, Giants' offense as a whole, though, 
uh, that is another situation where I want to monitor to see if there's any big movement for a trade. I don't think they can get through the rest of the season without a wide receiver. Yeah, I think I, I'm i not super concerned about just the rest of the season for the Giants. I think for me, I'm trying to be a little positive and just feel like this was just a worst case and it just – it was bad weather. And I want to say that Dallas defense is just freaking good. And there was no blocking. And that was the thing I would be concerned about if they can't figure out that offensive line to at least be average. Like, they're never going to be a top five unit, top ten unit. But, like, it didn't even look like they were trying to block Micah Parsons or the rest of that line. And if you don't have time to do anything, like, we've seen it in plenty of Super Bowls. Like, Patrick Mahomes looked mortal when he was getting chased around the field against the Bucks a couple years ago. Like, if you have a guy in your face that quickly, like you can't do anything. Um, I think the rest of the season, the Giants offense is going to level out and be kind of just what it was last year. I'm not having higher expectations than last year. I think Daniel Jones could be a top 15 quarterback with the rushing. Um, I don't think it's going to come through the air, but you know, the rushing upside is there. We saw him take off a bunch. Um, he's going to have to take off a bunch. And yeah. I think Saquon should be fine. And it did look like he wanted to get the ball to Waller, but I just think we can't really compare anything to what we saw the other night. And I don't even think the Giants are going to try to compare anything. I think they're going to delete that game tape I, yeah. and move on. You you have to, you know, because that's got to – it was a divisional game too. You know you're going to have to see them again. So you need to wipe, you need to wipe your memory on that. Um, you know, I just – for me, it comes down to a few things. It comes down to quarterback play. I don't think the quarterback is good enough to overcome some of the things that they have going on there. Um, and again, I think their only real play here would be to be in the market for a receiver because you you can't have your franchise quarterback that you just gave a ton of money to be running for his life. You know what I mean? You have to have a dependable go-to guy. And maybe you have a, one of these wide receivers really emerge as a solid number two guy. Like maybe you have that, but in this type of, um, I guess, boilermaker that they got going on over there, no one's, to me, looks like the type of guy that's going to step up and be a wide receiver one for this offense currently. And that's going to, that's going to cap everybody on, on this team fantasy wise. Yeah. So moving on to our last overreaction of the show, we've seen the best of Josh Allen. Let's say the last couple years. Have we seen the best of Josh Allen? Well, I think you can expect his rushing to go down. Um, I I mean, as time goes on, we see rushing quarterbacks have I, – I, they just lose a little bit of juice in their legs. Um, Josh Allen is still a top three fantasy quarterback. There's very few guys that have the potential to, quote, unquote, break fantasy um, quite like he does. He has consistently been there year in and year out. This is one where I can't panic on. The offense is still good. The Jets defense is really good. Um, you know, offensive scoring as a whole was down this year compared to the last two years. Um, the amount of touchdowns scored were, were down. However, some of those throws, man, were bad. Like, those throws were kind of inexcusable for a guy that you expect to be playing at a Super Bowl cal caliber level. You know, if they want to be there, Josh Allen can't be making the type of mistakes that he was making. The, the balls, that it, it seemed like he it, he either wasn't reading the field right or he was trying to force things way too much in situations that he couldn't really afford to do that in. Um, you know, so for, for me, you can't do anything about it other than ride it through. I think, again, we, it, we can look at it like maybe you'll have a little bit less rushing volume only because of them looking like they're playing, uh, you know, James Cook the way they should, um, which is which is encouraging for James Cook owners. Uh, but, yeah, I, I still expect him to finish top three in, in, in the NFL this year for fantasy purposes. Yeah, I think Josh Allen is just one of those guys that it's it's hard not to trust your eyes because in watching him on, like, you know, watching him play the game, like, I just think he's a better fantasy football quarterback than he is a real-life NFL quarterback. Um, and that's not trying to insult him at all. Like, He's still a very good NFL quarterback, but it's just he's going to put the stats up. He just tries to force it a little yeah. much, I think, is it. Like, 
you can tell like if it's not going his way, he he starts running and and that's great for fantasy. You want him to run for fantasy, but you watch the game and you're like, dude, just get down, man. Like you don't got to take that hit. You don't got to throw that ball. Like it's just, you don't got to make everything happen on every play. Like he's trying to be Superman when he's got some good players around him where he doesn't have to be like, yeah. I understand having to be Superman. Like Daniel Jones has to be Superman. There is no one around Daniel Jones. Right. Josh Allen has digs. Kincaid looked pretty good for his first start. James yeah. Cook looked great. Like, you know, and that defense is good and they have a steady head coach. Like there's no reason to go out there and lose the game. Yeah, I, I would be looking, though, to, to try to lean into that a little bit and, and see what I can get for some of these guys. Maybe there is some panic around Josh Josh Allen owners, you know, or somebody who has Diggs and they're like, man, Josh Allen don't look great this year. Can I expect a top five uh, season from Diggs or a top 10 season from Diggs? Go after these guys on offenses that maybe didn't click on all cylinders because the Bills is still one I'm invested in heavily. I would still love to have, um, you know, pieces of James Cook if I can. You know, so I'm, I'm looking to buy these guys where, wherever I can. And hopefully I get somebody who just so happens to be lower on them this week. Yeah, I think uh, my last note in the Bills game is just like, just like you said, I'm not too worried about the Bills offensive pieces. Um, I think for game one, um, I'm a big Kincaid fan. I was all summer. I was before the draft. Um, I was actually very happy with his usage. I mean, I don't think he got the massive targets that we wanted right away, but it was week one. And he played a ton. That's the thing I think we need to focus on is Dalton Kincaid was on the field a lot yesterday. Yeah. And yeah. that is going to equate to some fantasy production this year. Um, it may not just be the peak peak tight end production we're looking for yet because he's sharing the field with Dawson Knox. But I think coming up, he's only going to get better. And there is space for a number two weapon there because it is not Gabe Davis, man. That is not the answer. I could not agree more. I love Kincaid. He's one of those guys that's going to be a late season play. Um, tight end position shaky this year. We really don't know what we got. There's going to be, I think, rookie players in the top 10 for the first time in a while. I mean, obviously, besides Pitts. But I think we're going to, we could possibly see two of them end up there. Um, there's just not a whole lot of talent at the position. And – Offensive should be getting creative in the way that they're using these guys. I mean, I saw Kincaid go out to the slot a few times or motion out. Um, so that's encouraging how much time he's – and the targets compared to uh, to Knox, um, four and four, I expect that to completely go away for Knox eventually and, and Kincaid to be on the field consistently during a playoff stretch for us. So I'm, I'm buying Kincaid as well. I mean, that number really only needs to be realistically six or seven in Kincaid's a top 12 play. That's yeah. it. Like that number doesn't even need to go up that much. And um, just to go off what you said, I totally agree. I think come week 13 through 17, I think Kincaid, I think Musgrave, and I think Laporta could all be top 12 tight ends yeah. on a week in week out basis. Um, just based on their involvement week one, mm -hmm. I, I think I loved it, but yeah, uh, so that's man, exciting stuff. The yeah. ball's back. I know, man, that is our show today. Thank you guys for tuning in. Nick, thanks for hopping on, man. I was stoked to get you on your first show here at Dynasty. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Um, do you got any last notes for anyone watching? What's one piece of advice for week two coming up? Uh, be active on the waiver wire. I mean, if 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 you can, try to get these guys cheap. You know, try to catch somebody, you know, your, your league mates off a little bit. Um, and if you don't like any of the value, wait to see who they drop. People panic drop a lot of people. So if you can hold your waiver priority – I, and and possibly get somebody who you know was was dropped. A good example would be somebody like a Zach Charbonnet, right? If you have league mates who are going to be panic dropping him because you know they're more casual players, those are the guys that you want to be targeting and scooping up scooping up week two. That's a great piece of advice. Yeah, if you have any more questions for us, you can check me out at Where's Waldorf on Twitter. You can check Nick out here at N Goodwin underscore TV. But thanks for hopping on, guys, and can't wait to see you next week.